my name is Betty Cruz. Uh, thank you all for gathering with us here today. Um, I'm the president and CEO of the World Affairs Council of Pittsburgh. Um, I joined the team in January. So uh, what a ride it has been these last few months. Uh, but we are excited to be here today as part of our Building Back Better virtual program series. This is language that we've uh, borrowed from the World Bank in a report that they released a few years back on post-disaster recovery and how we might build back better. So in this moment with everything that's going on in the world, initially sparked by um, COVID and the physical isolation and uh, uh, need that that prompted, but certainly as we are now navigating important real conversations that need to be accelerated to address um, racial justice, not just in our country, but in the world, we want to use these opportunities to reimagine a different future and to get to action. So thank you all for being here uh, with us today. <clears throat> the mission of the World Affairs Council of Pittsburgh is to provide a pathway for a more globally minded region, offering students and the community a learning space that covers key international issues. So again, the space is now a virtual one, uh, but it is a space nonetheless, and it's our community and you're a part of our community and we're so thankful that you're here with us today. Um, for as far as today's program, I'm going to give you a quick rundown and then I'm going to turn it over to our terrific speakers. So we're here to learn more about the sustainable de development goals and why they're important. Uh, we're going to hear from Ambassador Sarah Mendelson and she's going to deliver remarks on how we navigate and work towards the sustainable development goals, the 2030 goals in light of COVID and as well, given all that has accelerated quickly in the last few weeks and how we apply that uh, lens of equity to this work. So um, after Ambassador Mendelssohn gives her overview, uh, we're going to turn it over to Hannah, and she's going to then uh, facilitate a conversation with our, with our other guests. So Hannah Shin is a junior at North Allegheny Senior High School. She's going to take it away after the ambassador. And again, Ambassador Mendelssohn is going to then be joined by Deputy Chief of Staff and Chief, Chief, and Chief <laughs> Equity Officer for Mayor William Peduto, Majestic Lane and Executive Director of Sustainable Pittsburgh, Dr. Joylette Portlock. Um, so excited to hear from everyone. We're going to have time at the end as well to take questions. So uh, feel free to use the comment bar if you're joining us from uh, live on Facebook or if you're in the, the Zoom room and wanna uh, chat anything uh, throughout, throughout the time that we're together, by all means, feel free. But we're also going to have a Q&A portion where our Zoom participants will be able to, to voice their questions and engage in a dialogue with our um, speakers. So first I'd like to introduce to you uh, Ambassador Sarah Mendelson. She is a distinguished service professor of public policy at Carnegie Mellon University and head of Carnegie Mellon's Heinz College in Washington, DC. She served as the US representative to economic and social council and social council at the United Nations until January 20th, 2017. Confirmed by the Senate in October 2015, she was a US UN lead on international development, human rights, and humanitarian affairs. There, she oversaw campaigns to get develop to get country-specific resolutions passed on the General Assemb Assembly and to get NGOs, including the Committee to Protect Journalists, accredited to the UN. She led efforts to elevate the issue of combating human trafficking and was senior lead for the President's Summit on Refugees. Her current work centers on growing and supporting the generation that will demand and deliver the Sustainable Development Goals, Cohort 2030, with a focus on building peaceful, just, and inclusive societies. At Carnegie Mellon, she co-chairs the University's Sustainability Initiative announced by the Provost at UNGA 74. Ambassador Mendelssohn, please take it away. Thank you so much. I'm coming to you from my living room in Washington, DC. I wish I could be with you in Pittsburgh, although I'm seeing folks from around the globe, so, so very much welcome. I do really want to speak to those of you who were born after 1980, maybe born after the year 2000. Uh, this is a, the world is upside down right now, and we all recognize that. But I want you to take heart that this is an agenda that is ever more relevant for today. And you are the generation that will, will uh, lead us forward and help us deliver. So I wanna do a few brief things in the time that I have. Um, 
I want, so some of you are absolutely steeped in the sustainable development goals, the SDGs, some of you are not. So I wanna just have a quick refresh on what it is, but I also wanna offer some comments about how they came together, because I think they really, it really underscores how they're built for this moment um, and how much of a paradigm shift they are in multiple different ways, uh, but also to recognize some obstacles, uh, but also opportunities. So first, this is an agenda that is about building peaceful, prosperous planet and people. Uh, it is an agenda that is very much a 21st century focus on this concept of sustainable development. And I'll, I'll come back to that in a, in a minute. So this came together over three years. Millions of people around the world weighed in on what should be in the agenda. Young people were the most active. Uh, and then of course there was negotiation and pulling together concepts in various capitals around the world. I was the interagency lead uh, when I was at US Agency for International Development for what became goal 16. Uh, although we like to think of it as a larger agenda, peaceful, just, inclusive societies. It then went to negotiation in New York. Uh, and what's really interesting is it is a, it's very different from the predecessor, the Millennium Development Goals. Those were put together really by a handful of men. They applied only to the Global South and they didn't address issues of governance, rights, all the issues that we're dealing with today and what happened was a handful of female ambassadors at the UN said, if this agenda does not address issues of inequality, inequity, peace, security, we're not signing on. These were women who were from countries that had just emerged from war uh, and they had a powerful voice and they, they used it. So that was really quite amazing. So how is this a paradigm shift? First of all, this is an agenda that applies to all of us it is uh, an agenda that has rights woven through, but it's a real shift from global North donors talking to global South activist countries around the world. And it means that it allows us to recognize that in the United States, development happens here as well. So this is a 21st century conception of sustainability. It's about climate, but it's also about the climate of communities, well-being and dignity. It's really important that people understand this is not, it includes climate issues, but it's much broader. It's understanding the hidden linkages and holistic nature, not just for example, that transportation is just about transportation, but transportation affects communities. Where you put transportation, how you build a bridge going through a community has an impact. It's not, for example, air pollution. How does this affect different communities? It's also about designing differently. Uh, data about people, but with people at the center, having it be demand-driven rather than supply-driven. And it chal challenges us not to think in terms of the developed world versus the developing world. And I, I'm gonna come back to that in a second. So when, when COVID first struck, I was in a lot of conversations with colleagues about what does this mean for the SDGs? And I wrote a blog where I, th I envisioned three possibilities. Number one, it could be the case that this completely obliterates the SDGs. We just, it's, it's too much and we're not gonna deal with it. The second possibility was we sort of would go back to where we were before. The third possibility, which if I wrote it two months ago, I feel it to be absolutely uh, more strongly today is that this agenda is built for now that the aspects of COVID laid bare inequities uh, in our communities that are unacceptable uh, in terms of, of health outcomes. Um, but now today, our acknowledgement of structural racism makes this even more uh, relevant. And I'll tell you why, uh, connecting to a couple of specific SDGs. Now, some of you, um, again, are steeped in the various uh, numbers, uh, some of you are not. So let me try and unpack this briefly. I think it's really important to think of the SDGs in terms of clusters. There's a big climate cluster. There's also a cluster of uh, goals that were essentially pulled forward from the predecessor, the Millennium De Development Goals. So issues around reducing poverty, um, health, uh, uh, education, uh, food security, 
uh, gender, they, those were all pulled forward. What was really new about this agenda was that there was the inclusion of what we call the peaceful, just, inclusive societies. So think of that cluster as one that is especially relevant today. It's about goal 16, which is about peace, justice, and strong institutions, but poverty, education, gender, decent work, reducing inequalities, sustainable cities, and of course, doing this together as a partnership are really critical. So when you think of it that way, this agenda emerges as absolutely urgent and timely. So what do we mean even by peaceful, just, inclusive societies? So in terms of peaceful, we're talking about a culture of peace and nonviolence. That's a target 4.7. There's actually a campaign around cutting in half all forms of violence by 2030. That's 16.1. There's a lot of work around uh, stopping violence against children, women and girls, 16.2 and 5.2. Uh, there's a, three places where in the, in the goals where uh, efforts to eradicate human trafficking are occurring. But it's also about safe spaces, educational facilities, workplaces, and transport. That's also a part of peaceful societies. There is a campaign around radically increasing access to justice. Uh, for some folks, that's about environmental justice. That's certainly about racial justice. There's a big campaign around making sure everyone has legal identity. In many countries, if you don't have identity, you can't own property. And that, of course, affects uh, women in many places. Um, equal access to education. So you're getting a sense that this is a much broader agenda than just uh, climate. And then, of course, the inclusive part of this is absolutely critical. So we're talking about effective, accountable institutions. We're talking about women's particip participation and leadership inclusive and participatory decision-making, social, economic, and political inclusion. And here, I really, I wanna share with you some of my thoughts that are gonna be published shortly uh, in a new blog. And that is really in some ways a critique of how the traditional community that has worked on human rights around the world has functioned. And I've been part of that for 25 years. And this is very separate from the very excellent work that the civil rights community has done in this country. Now, and it's also an indictment in part of the international development community. And what do I mean by this? You know, in UN circles, in foreign policy circles, in um, international development circles, there are categories and the World Bank uses these categories of developed countries, less developed countries, but when we disaggregate data, when we look at city level data in the United States, in Pittsburgh, in Washington, DC, what do we see? Um, I live in the District of Columbia. In Ward 5 in the District of Columbia, the life expectancy is 67. The World Bank, looking at Botswana, says the life expectancy is 69.6. .6. If we go on from this moment talking about the United States as a developed country, we are missing what is going on in communities all around us. Um, I wanna to point to the report that came out in September, 2019 on uh, inequities in Pittsburgh that was done by colleagues at the University of Pittsburgh. And I think the mayor's office was involved in it. We, we need to get to a moment where this is just no longer uh, acceptable and we're not gonna tolerate it. And I'm pushing my colleagues who work in foreign policy, international development and the human rights space to be thinking about this now um, as a former State Department employee, as a former AID employee. Uh, there is a role to play in solidarity with human rights activists around the world, but generating reports on human rights conditions in other countries while this is going on in this country is not a way to advance human rights uh, and democracy around the world. So I feel very much that um, we can take advantage of this moment. I wanna say one more thing about cohort 2030. Um, do I have still a few minutes? Yeah, okay. So what is what do we mean by cohort 2030? And why do I look to Hannah and think, wow, this is so exciting that we have this next generation. I think there are elements in the SDGs that are very compatible with the younger generation, with youth. What do I mean by that? Number one, uh, you are digital natives. Uh, you, you have grown up always on 
some form, some platform. And that can be incredibly helpful in terms of living in this, this world that is not only disrupted, but it's distributed. So you have native fluency and in innovation and technology. But we're also seeing a lot of empathy and attitudes towards diversity, inclusion, gender, and identity that are really radically different from previous generations. In many countries, there's extreme antipathy regarding corruption, uh, and that is a very important aspect to advancing justice, but hasn't always figured largely. The younger generation also has an interest in ethically sourced and environmentally sound products, which of course can help with your big concern, which is obviously part of the sustainable development goals and that concerns climate change. So for all those reasons, we're thinking of cohort 2030 um, as an incredibly important part of advancing the SDGs. But a lot of people don't know about this agenda. So raising awareness and platforms like this is really critical. We can't expect that the goals are gonna be delivered if people don't even know that they exist. So trying to figure out what are the policy asks, how do we get to action? How do we get stuff done on this is something that we've got to move to uh, next. But I, I, I just wanna leave with folks with the idea that this agenda is gonna help us get us to where we wanna go and get us out of the situation that we're in now. Uh, so don't lose hope uh, and, and keep on it. All right, enough from me, over to Hannah. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ambassador Mendelssohn, for your fascinating remarks. It's so insightful and thought-provoking to see how you explain the clusters of SDGs that promote peaceful and prosperous planet and people, and I, I love that. And I also really appreciate how you talked about the history of how it formed and the modern implications of what it means, especially during this tough time. I just want to introduce myself briefly to everyone. Um, my name is Hannah Shin, and I am a rising junior at North Allegheny. I'm really interested in SDGs, especially because as society mobilizes to take action against a variety of issues, a lot of which are being highlighted during these really difficult times. I think it's just as important to not only create social change, but to make sure that the impacts of this are lasting. And as Ambassador Mendelssohn talked about cohort 2030, I'm really interested in how, as a youth, uh, it is really our duty to protect, you know, the upcoming world and to become civically engaged and more informed on these issues. And I'm really especially excited to be in this discussion here today because I think the first step towards advancing to sustainability is to have conversations on it. And so I really want to thank everyone who joined in today. I'm excited for the dialogue we'll have and the meaningful discussions to learn about these issues. Oh yeah, and so briefly, as I said, I'm really thankful to be here sharing a youth voice as a moderator. And um, yeah, I'm excited to share my perspective as a high school student, a teenager uh, here in Pittsburgh. Uh, yeah, so as we prepare for this conversation, it is my pleasure to introduce you to these two individuals, Chief Majestic Lane and Dr. Joylette Portlock. Uh, to start off, Chief Majestic Lane serves as the Deputy Chief of Staff and Chief Equity Officer for Mayor William Peduto. Through these roles, Chief Lane leads the Petito administration's focus on opportunity for all residents of the city of Pittsburgh, especially concerning education, workforce development, safe and healthy communities, and digital inclusion. Following suit, Dr. Joylette Portlock, Executive Director of Sustainable Pittsburgh, studied biology and anthropology at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and she earned her doctorate in genetics at Stanford, designing genetics programs for science museums. We're excited for her sharing her insights on using science as a mobile, a vehicle for social change. Since 2007, Dr. Portlock has worked on environmental issues at the local, state, and federal levels, focusing on addressing climate change. So yeah, we are so excited to have both of you here today, and Amanda, Ambassador Mendelssohn. Uh, please join me in giving them a warm welcome. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so as we begin our conversation, I have a few questions prepared um, that I've really been thinking about. And uh, just before we start, I wanna give a really brief preface. And I understand that these are definitely unexpected times um, with the sudden changes brought about in these current situations. And especially as a youth, I've definitely noticed the impact with like my school year cut short and everything. And I know everyone from business leaders, uh, nonprofit organizations, everyone has definitely felt the impact of this. And I think 
It further highlights the importance of not only the SDGs in and of themselves, but um, the fact that we're striking discussion on them today, that we're talking about how we can, you know, equip our community to be more resilient during this time. So I have prepared a few questions, as I said, and I do want to be cognizant of time. So it'd be great if uh, you could briefly answer in about a minute or so, but we really do want to hear your thoughts. So we encourage each of you to share what you can about this. So I just as a brief start, uh, in conjunction with your introduction, uh, we'd love to get to know each of you a bit more. So I was wondering, is there a specific sustainability issue or SDG that you care most deeply about or something that really strikes your interest? Uh, what is it and why? Um, should, is there, do you want to order or how do you want to, oh, you, you want me to go it. first? Okay. <laughs> um, that's, that's an interesting one. Um, I think my role and my job is to kind of see across many of them, um, as I think we'll talk about, I think the idea of the, you know, peace, like the strong institutions, um, is a really, really important one right now, but also the idea of decent work and what that means and what that means throughout the globe. But also, I think we've a little we've not been as focused on what that means within our, our country. I think COVID has exposed the conversation of work within our country, um, what is deemed essential and what is not, how we work, um, our proximity to each other within work, what people are paid to work. Um, and I think we we'll have a new conversation about the future of work in ways that then will shift, hopefully, our educational systems. Because I would argue our education system has been based on an outdated system of work. And even as things have changed, we've kept the educational systems the same. But now the shifting of work, I think, will, will, will force that. So I think that's one that's really uh, practical to me right now, besides, obviously, the building of those, these institutions, which I think is the underpinning of what we are challenged with right now. Yeah, that's awesome. I completely agree. Like, it's so interesting to consider that um, this pandemic has really uncovered the roots around how our society is functioning. And the what you said about the essential versus <clears throat> essential, that really makes you think harder about the structure of work. So yeah, thank you. Uh, would Dr. Portlock like to go next? Or? Sure, yeah. Um, so this is an interesting question. And I think, um, a little hard, you know, how do you choose just one of the SDGs to be favored? There's certain, uh, there are obviously ones that seem um, more uh, immediately relevant given the times and the um, uh, vast importance and critical nature of the conversation we're having right now nationally about race um, and equity. But I think it, what's useful for me in looking at the SDG framework. And so Sustainable Pittsburgh has been operating in this region for 21 years, um, doing work on, you know, that touches all of these, these things. But what I find really helpful about the UN SDG framework is the inherent uh, interrelationships between all of the goals. Right. So I think that, you know, as you mentioned in, in, in that introduction, thank you for that. Um, uh, climate has always been uh, a specific focus of mine in my work experience, but it's through the SDG framework that I think you can see that um, you can't talk about climate without talking about education, without talking about economy, without talking about equity, right? These, these things are all tied together. And what I think is really valuable for us here in Southwestern Pennsylvania specifically um, is that it provides us a framework and an ability to have those intersectional conversations um, in the way that's really needed to get traction on these problems, right? If we really want to see these changes, we have to start um, creating new and better and deeper collaborations along a lot of different axes. Uh, and the framework allows us uh, a way to, to visualize that and to, and to, to move forward with it. So, um, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going <laughs> to officially punch your question, Anna, uh, and not answer by picking just one. But I think that really the, the key value, especially in a region that has as much fragmentation as ours, 
130 different municipal governments in the county of Allegheny alone. Um, any number of organizations doing good work. Um, there's so much good happening, but if we really want to achieve the goals as they're stated, if we really want to improve our, our, our situation in all of our communities, it's something we're going to have to start uh, getting really just very effective at working together on. Yeah, I love what you said. And another thing that, you know, when I first heard about the SDGs a while back, I remember it's like 17 is a very odd number to have exactly 17 SDGs, but that's how insanely important each and every one of them is. Like you can't get rid of one, you can't really just choose one over the other because they all work together. And so, yeah, I really appreciate how you focus on how interdisciplinary and how each sector works together and how it's really a collaborative process. So, yeah. Well, in, in 2012 and through 2014, goal 16 was actually split in two is 12 and uh, 13, somehow 12 and 13 ended up being 16. But um, you're right that it does seem sort of odd. I will just, fun fact, um, I don't know how many of you have ever seen four weddings and a funeral, but the director of that and Notting Hill Richard Curtis was the person who put together the periodic chart um, that you see for the SDGs. He's a huge fan uh, and is also involved in, in um, trying to get people to know more about it. Um, I think that Dr. Portlock's conversation about the intersection of these is really critical. For me, and I'm, I'm, I won't punt, I will go back to a specific goal, but what's interesting about this all for me is the uh, sustainable development, understanding it in this broader context is really a mindset. And once you start looking at all sorts of problems with this mindset, lots of things get uncovered and there are hidden connections that you didn't necessarily see before. Uh, and that is, and you start thinking, perhaps I've been spending a lot of time with engineers recently. I think you start thinking like an engineer. Um, and for me, at, coming from the human rights and democracy, the international human rights and democracy community, that has been so enriching because that community has been very focused for a long time on legal frameworks. Legal frameworks are important, but they're not everything, and particularly when they're not actually applied. Um, so for example, the work I've done on human trafficking over the last 20 years, the dominant paradigm has been around prosecution global prosecution numbers have actually not really ticked up. There are lots of laws that countries have adopted and that's very good, but we need to broaden constituencies who know about this issue and who, who are engaged. So for me, the fact that 5.2, that target in, in uh, gender, 8.7 in decent work and 16.2 uh, around um, peaceful, just, inclusive societies is, and they're all about human trafficking. And so there's a way in which we could broaden constituencies. When you go to buy chocolate or you go buy, to buy a cotton shirt or you are buying an iPhone, understanding where the labor that went into that product is and demanding that it, there not be forced labor in that product. Um, as young people, you have a lot of power with your pocketbook to the extent that we still have pocketbooks your wallet, your credit card, um, your digital spending. And I think that understanding that power is, 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 uh, is, is great. So I'm gonna stop there. I've, I've also sort of half punted. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, thank you for your, yeah, thank you for your insights. It's awesome how much you know about the history of SDGs and also the implications. And I love how you mentioned that um, even like for the issue of human trafficking, it's it crosses several different SDGs. So there's many different ways to approach the issue from different like aspects um, of the UN's SDGs. So I really it, like I thought it was very insightful that you covered that. Can, can I say one thing about the UN? Because I, I think it's yeah yeah it, when it's useful to invoke the UN, invoke the UN. If you don't think it's useful, don't invoke the UN. The UN has actually relatively little to do. They have a convening power in July in a couple of weeks, they'll host virtually countries coming together to report out their progress. It's called the high level political forum, which is a very un -y term. And then during the general assembly, the same thing will happen. But this, these agendas are only gonna work if they're owned locally. Uh, 
if your local people want to link it to the UN, great. If they don't, that's fine too. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I think that's one of the, um, that's a very good insight um, and speaks also to the current conversation that we're having around racial equity, right? The, the solutions for all of these things are going to happen at this, this very granular local level. And that's, that's right. where we can all have an impact. Yeah, thank you. And like, um, I was actually going to ask about it in a later question, but I noticed that each of you have done significant work on the local level, but you've also seen how different aspects interact at a larger legislative level. So I was wondering if um, there's any things that you think local residents can do, even youth, um, to help promote sustainable change on a smaller scale, on the granular scale, like Dr. Portlock said. Well, what I'll say is I think it's about awareness. Um, I think far too often, and this may be as Ambassador Mendelssohn said, because people hear about it and they frame it with United Nations, then it feels like a large governmental global, you know, NGO kind of conversation versus these are practical things that are happening in your cities, right, in your communities that you can relate them down to, to that. And I think that's important to use them because I think with our conversation around COVID as well as around uh, the consistent police killings of unarmed residents, specifically African-Americans, um, you know, you see this consistency and you see that you need to have the peace, justice and strong institutions in order to work on that you need to see equity to work on those kind of conversations and those are the challenges that we're having and they're not just national challenges they're also local challenges because we know that some of our local uh institutions were not adapted we're not ready to deal with covid or if we, if we use an example the unemployment assistance and unemployment compensation structure at most state levels we're not ready to deal with you know hundreds of thousands of people uh, applying for unemployment compensation on the same day. So again, that's just an example of that it's not just these kind of global structures, that they're also very local. And by awareness of them, people can start to think of them. And as I think will be a constant refrain here, see the intersectionality and the interaction between all of these challenges, that things aren't in silos. For me, I think the benefit of the SDGs has been that you know, uh, the challenges of our time don't exist in silos. The challenges of our time are cross-sectional and that, you know, the SDGs are a model to think about things in a cross-sectional way and then relate to people around them in a cross-sectional way. And I think about 17 in particular, with the partnerships to achieve the goals become a really important component of the work that I do, acknowledging that there's sometimes that the city is a primary uh, driver, sometimes the city is a secondary driver, and sometimes the city is a tertiary driver of challenges that we find in our region. And looking at how can we, find, how we, how can we do a partnerships that go across that to still work to resolve issues. Yeah, thank you so much. I, yeah, I love what you said because I agree that if you say like UN SDGs, it can seem very kind of far-fetched and kind of idealistic, but from a local level, the impacts of it are very tangible and it can create direct change. Yeah. In terms of what, um, what people can do and what everyone can do, I think, you know, this is a very, these are very interesting times, right? That we're all living through. I think one of the things that can be done as you yourself said, Hannah, is, uh, is conversations. I think there's a lot of learning happening now. There's a lot of opportunity for learning to be happening right now because people are are are, are more open to it. it. It's very it's very interesting. I think because of the pandemic, um, because of the emergence and and again critical conversation about race, I think we're all living through a time that is in many ways vulnerable and very human and full of full of a lot of trauma but the flip side of that is that it creates i think an openness uh, and an opportunity for us to meet each other at that human level and really um 
and really start to think differently about some of these things. And I, I see that happening um, not just at the individual level of how we interact with each other's individuals, which is something I think everybody can and should be engaging in, but I see that also happening um, in the um, in, in at decision making tables, right? And with uh, people who are trying to figure out, okay, what's the most effective thing? What's the most helpful thing for us to do um, to help? large numbers of people. And those conversations are ongoing. And, and my hope is that this becomes not just a moment to, um, to kind of reel and shock and anger and heartbreak at the things that are happening in our world, but to further a resolve and build structures that can carry the impact of this time forward. I'm just looking at the chat. Um, so I think of these as, um, the global goals or our goals. Um, and the more people think of them as our goals, I think it's, it's very helpful. Um, my license plate reads taxation without representation. Um, Ambassador Rice today in the New York Times has a very powerful op-ed, um, a very moving op-ed from her own experience as a DC native and as a child uh, walking through downtown DC in 1968. We, this is ridiculous. We need statehood. Um, so I don't have a member of Congress to write to that can mobilize other members of Congress, but, but you do. Um, and it's something that I've been working through with my students, um, and we need more help on it, is how do you take the SDGs and make them a kind of policy toolkit? What is the ask? And, you know, people are busy. Students are super busy. So trying to think through um, how we could even facilitate young people thinking about what is the thing that I want to make a difference and what is who do I ask and make sure that it happens. Most members of Congress have never heard of this agenda. Uh, even my colleagues who served in the Obama administration and who got elected in 2018, um, it's we need to really elevate this. And when people are in Congress hear that the citizens of Pittsburgh or Allegheny County uh, or outside Philadelphia where I grew up, that they wanna see change in the, on very specific things, uh, helping the members of Congress figure out what it is because they're busy too, right? What is the, the, the thing that you wanna get focused on? Um, I will tell you, we did have one member of Congress, um, Representative Barbara Lee come to the UN in fall 2016 and in my bio, we mentioned the work I did on getting the Committee to Protect Journalists uh, uh, registered at the UN, which is a very ridiculous process. And there are a lot of countries that are not very supportive of civil society and NGOs. But she wanted to get the Congressional Black Caucus Institute accredited at the UN. And so we talked about it in terms of the SDGs. She thought that was a fantastic way to go. And they, she got through very quickly. It was after my time. I think it was sort of fall, spring, fall of 2017, but my, the crew that was still at USUN at the time helped get it through. But I think finding members of Congress that are champions or even bringing them along, you know, who's been really fantastic about this are certain mayors and Mayor Peduto among them. There's a real value add for the mayors. They talk to one another. They see that having the SDGs as a common frame is helpful. Yeah, for sure, thank you. Uh, I see that uh, I just want to be cognizant of time. And so I was thinking maybe we could enter into a speed round uh, where one of you could take a question and answer it as briefly as you can. Um, this one question was actually something I really wanted to ask. And so I see that each of you have come from different walks of life and you've approached your work in sustainability through different career paths and different um, insights, even as you shared on the specific uh, issues that you care most deeply about. And so I was wondering if there was a certain moment in your career when you realized that you really wanted to focus on sustainability, or was there a certain time when you most strongly realized its impact in your, not only your job, but around you? So yeah, if one of you could answer that, I'd be sure. I'd say um, it's when I recognize that sustainability as a broader theme that when you um, often people think of sustainability and think of just the environment, 
And when you connect that to certain communities who have suffered from environmental justice as well, as well as economic injustice or legal injustice, that sustainability is a broader ethic that you want to dedicate yourself to and see people flourish in all ways. So when I understood the broader relationship of environmental and economic justice, that's when uh, sustainability became important to me. Yeah, thank you. I read somewhere that um, statistics and numbers speak volumes, but stories are infinitely more powerful. And I completely agree that whenever you see how it truly impacts someone's life, it completely changes how important it is. Yeah. Okay, next question. Uh, this is actually um, kind of flows with what Chief Lane was saying earlier, but I was wondering if there's a specific aspect of sustainability that you think is like underrated or not talked about enough. Because I know uh, Chief Lane just said that uh, environment is a huge thing that comes to people's mind when you talk about sustainability. But is there an aspect that you think needs to be further discussed? Well, I think that uh, up until very recently, I would have said the social equity piece, right? Mm -hmm. I think that there's, you know, it's very understated and people don't always make that connection. But I think now we have, um, we have an opportunity to really, I think, really engage um, with some of those those goals in a, in a real way so so the, the cluster around 16 that I was talking about for the longest time we felt like this was kind of left behind you know the, the motto is leave no one behind but people were leaving out all these issues having to do with social equity and uh, sound governance the human rights side of it so it's been frankly, a bit frustrating over the last couple of years, you're constantly trying to bring it up and people are like, what are you talking about? It's really just about climate. Um, but, you know, for me, I started life as a Russia specialist, a Sovietologist actually. And um, Mr. Putin for the last 20 years has been all about what we call closing space, targeting activists. Uh, and then it became kind of a, um, its own pandemic. It's just happening all over the world and lots of different places. Um, and it, it was very frustrating. We got President Obama to speak on the issue, but it still kept happening. And for me, it just became, we have to have a different kind of approach. Something else is going on. These local organizations, people aren't seeing them as having traction in their locality. So they see them as somehow alien or outside. So we need to be working on what are best practices to make sure local civil society organizations are deeply embedded in their communities. Uh, and that's where I think the SDGs can help. Yeah, I think, I think also, um, you know, it, in response to the prior question, I, I think at its heart, you know, sustainability is really about taking a look a little bit farther outside than you just yourself right? It's about figuring out what we collectively need to survive and to sustain and to thrive in this world. And I think that that, for me, I think that's, that's always been, uh, always been important. But I think specifically in this moment, when we talk about what Ambassador Mendelssohn was just saying um, about the taxation without representation license plates I actually lived in DC when they when they first created those a number of years ago and I thought that's really perfect. Um, but that's just one example of the ways in which the situation doesn't improve for those who are in living in the injustice, unless those outside of it care and engage. Right. And so mm -hmm. I think we have a moment in a number of ways to to really start looking at the ways in which we are all not just the SDGs are interconnected, but the ways in which we are all ourselves interconnected um, and 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 lift those voices. Yeah, thank you for sharing. I, I love that, um, especially with sustainability and all these different issues. It's really not just a global effort, but every single person in the local community too is heavily involved. And so um, as we are wrapping up our conversation, I had one final really quick question. And I was wondering if each of you could describe sustainability in one word. What word comes to mind? One word. Yes. One oh boy. For me, um, 
just as a startup, um, for me, that one adjective would be resiliency because mm. I think um, sustainability is definitely about making sure that the impacts are lasting, but there's also so much history that has come before. And I think sustainability can only be fully achieved when we're resilient and we worked collaboratively. So I guess collaboratively would be another word too, but for the sake of the one word, yeah. Our moderator just used two words. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. Uh, I, so I, I'll go. Um, when I think about sustainable sustainability, I just think about agency. Um, mm -hmm. And I think about the agency of people to, to, uh, to determine their own future and in the, in the, in the agency of the collective society. So. Yeah, I love that. At the risk of, um, of sounding hokey, I'm going to say hope. I think that uh, at its core, sustainability is about um, a journey towards an ideal. It's about improvement. It's about seeing a better possibility on the horizon. Um, and I think that that's essential for us to actually achieve those goals. <laughs> so I'm going to go with hope. Yeah, and before I give you my two words, um, you know, an aspirational agenda like this, I think a lot of people, either they blow it off or they're skeptical, and we can't get there with skepticism. The hope is going to get us there. Um, you know, and waiting for somebody else to take charge or waiting for, you know, a president or a governor or a senator, it's not going to happen. It has to be everybody together in it. Um, I guess I'd say uh, dignity and longevity were the two words that were coming to mind. Um, but it's a good question. Thank you. Uh, I know I accidentally said two words, but <laughs> <laughs> I love I love all of your answers. So yeah. Yeah, so um, thank you for taking the time to answer my questions. I love how you all have such different ideas on sustainability, but I think the resonating theme that I got from your answers is really how collaborative and cross-sectional the SDGs are. And I love what you said earlier about it's a policy toolkit. Yeah. And so we will uh, now move into a Q&A session. So participants will have the uh, ability to ask questions via chat. I know a few people have asked questions from Ambassador, Ambassador Mendelssohn earlier. And also you, there will be time now to unmute and speak if you would like to. So yeah, as we enter. Oh, thank you, Ms. Lockley. I appreciate it. Yes, kudos <laughs> to Hannah. There's a hand raised. No, oh, yeah, Emily, would you like to unmute and speak? Yeah, hi everyone, uh, great conversation. I'm happy to be here. Um, so I have a question about I guess y'all's personal theory of change, uh, because when I think of sustainability, a lot of time for me growing up, I didn't really think it was a place that I belonged. And I know that some people may think that, like the space, like when I've thought of like historically sustainable, sustainability in terms of the, the environment, I've always seen it as a white space. That's just what I've always seen it as. Um, so for those who may think like that, like to be included in this. What's your personal personal theory of how to make this space feel like it's made for everyone? Um, that it's not an academic space, academic only space, that it's not just a white space or um, spaces where people are in positions of power. That's an awesome question. Yeah. Um, well, I'll, I'll say just for me, um, one, it's just by seeing more diverse people in the space and seeing more diverse ideas and possibilities in the space. I think um, often it has been framed as a certain space because of the interests who, the interests of folks who uh, kind of were in the space and then the narrative. So I think as you, as you get more people in the space with diverse perspectives and are enlarging the narrative of a conversation around sustainability, then it can be seen more as things that have a much more humanistic viewpoint where it's shared across uh, boundaries. So I think an important thing is 
that for conversations like these and then for people to assert that they do support these kind of things and then make them relevant in the ways for everything from human trafficking to decent work to green space to you know uh legal institutions and show that all those things are about that the undergirding of a society for that agency and for that collaboration for that survival of, of humanity awesome thank you also i saw dr portlock also unmuted herself I did, um, but Majestic beat me to the punch, which is absolutely fine. Um, I think, so two things, I think that there's a uh, disambiguation uh, between who is in the space currently and what the space is, right? Um, things like environment and climate, these things all matter to all of us, right? And if the people in the space are not reflective of all of the people, then that's an opportunity to, to engage, right? If the agenda and the outcomes of what is perceived as uh, the environmental sector are not reflective of what you would like to see, I mean, I think personally, I, I would view that as an opportunity to, <laughs> to engage and try to broaden what that agenda looks like. Um, and, you know, I would, I would also just say that, that yeah, uh, that kind of representation I think matters. Uh, and in my experience has, you know, it, it, it's, in, it's important to try to build those bridges. And I don't wanna say that, you know, that means that there's no work to be done on the part of the existing institutions to intentionally engage in uh, more respectful and uh, and and more impactful ways, because there's there's definitely uh, room for that as well. I think there's a lot of activity um, always happening, right, in communities that aren't necessarily the face of a movement um, that absolutely should be included and respected as well. So. Um, I think there's there's work to be done on that side too, but I think that uh, that uh, it, I, I view the I view those um, those as opportunities to engage. So Emily, your question to my mind brings up two things that I think are big challenges for all of us who are devoted to this agenda. One is translating this agenda into actual action, um, and being able to on some level reflect it so that we have what I like to think of as an SDG effect, right? So in two years, three years, five years, 10 years, what do we want to see happen? What, 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 is, what do we want to see in Pittsburgh or in DC? And how are we going to get there? And when people start to see that there is an impact, I think that more communities are going to come along. Um, and, but, you know, as I've written elsewhere, uh, particularly in reference to Pittsburgh, because there's so much activity going on in Pittsburgh. You guys are, in many ways, all eyes are on Pittsburgh. We, I'm calling it the Pittsburgh platform. Um, but making sure that that aspiration turns into action, I know that's what we all want. Uh, and I think that will be uh, bringing folks along. And, and I'll say there's a lot of other cities that are engaged and excited and, and interested. Um, so don't feel like Pittsburgh's by itself. Awesome, thank you. I think we have time for another question. So um, yeah, that was a really good question, Emily, thank you. Don't you be shy. Oh, what's your question? Please. I'm encouraging people not to be shy. Oh yeah. They're not shy in the chat. Holly They're W has a question. <laughs> Holly, would you like to unmute and ask your question? So um, I live in Pittsburgh and my school has recently distinguished itself as a global school. And we are actively looking for ways to use the sustainable development goals and all of our programming for our students. And, um, and we're very excited about this. But I'm wondering if, um, the, the guest speakers could talk about the challenge of um, uh, having 
like everyone feel like these are important to try. You know what I mean? Like, like how do you um, again see that they're important and even though they seem huge and really grand? How how do you make them? How do you make people feel like they're doable? Can I share a recent experiment that we ran at Carnegie Mellon? Um, it's called the 17 Rooms. And if you Google it, you'll see some information about it. We essentially, so th none of this is a conversion exercise, right? I mean, people have to come to it on some level, excited about it and see what's there. But we invited, basically, we did 17 Zooms, a one hour conversation where people could choose which room they wanted to go into and share what they were doing at Carnegie Mellon in terms of education, research, or practice, right? So we're doing a voluntary university review. We're trying to figure out how does CMU align its education that could be classes, but it could also be experiential learning, uh, research that's done, and the practice. And that seems to be a way for both raising awareness about the issue, but also making it a little bit comprehensible for people so that they say, oh yeah, you know, I'm actually really devoted to clean water or issues about uh, inequity um, or gender uh, and giving them space. And yeah. if I could just uh, tag on to that, so Sustainable Pittsburgh is part of a collaborative effort. We're helping to convene um, a number of different groups across different sectors to try and do a similar kind of exercise, but at a, at a regional scale. And so that's engaging um, nonprofits, um, gover municipal governments, it's engaging the for-profit sector. Um, and one of the things that, one of the, I think most important learnings kind of ties into this whole discussion that we've been having is really around uh, the SDGs aren't necessarily they're not a whole new thing that you're impressing upon people, right? These are the things we all already care about, are already invested in, are already working on and thinking about. It's just a framework for how to talk about those things. And so I think that can go a long way to helping people view them as more relevant, right? Yeah, thank you. I agree that they're really intuitive and um, they can seem very like institutional and um, kind of like, big and like too hard to think about, but they're really in intuitive and it's really things that are really dear to our heart. And so uh, I really wanted to thank everyone for your engagement. Uh, unfortunately, time is closing to the end. So, um, yeah, but we really value your questions and I could truly go on and on talking with all of you. And I loved hearing your thoughts. Just as a really brief comment, uh, I promise I'll pass it over to Betty after this, but um, basically what uh, I wanted to say before I ended was that uh, a quick question that I was going to ask if we had time. It's fine that we didn't. I loved our discussion, but I wanted to ask if each of you had sustainability role models or like mm -hmm. that you really look up to who's been promoting positive change. And I really do think that the three of you are sustainability role models, especially in our Pittsburgh area and further on. And so, yeah, thank you for uh, answering my questions. Uh, and yeah, I really loved hearing each of your comments. I'll pass it on to Ms. Cruz. Thank you, Hannah. And now I really want to know your sustainability role model. So you got to tell us, we can take an, an extra minute. Yeah, so um, I have two, but um, the first one is, I'm pretty sure everyone knows, but Rachel Carson. And I just, I love that she used science as a platform for social change and, um, her impact might not be recognized as much um, in terms of like saving lives, but it's so important the work that she did. And also I love uh, Jonas Salk. And the reason that I mentioned him, the scientist who invented the polio vaccine is he didn't do a lot of advocacy work in terms of sustainability, but um, the change that he created and the fact that uh, he has this one quote and it says, can you patent the sun? No, because it belongs to everyone. So I love that he was able to save millions of lives and it was a completely selfless act. And I think that's really the enigma, the epitome of the people who are creating sustainable change. So yeah, thank you. <laughs> I got to answer a question too. Thank you for sharing that. Would um, our three speakers, anyone want to jump in with your role models before we bring it to a close? I'll say really quickly, uh, Bob Bullard, um, uh, who many may know 
has been involved with the environmental justice for some some time, and also uh, Fannie Lou Hamer. Um, and there, and I say that because she was an example of the confluence of um, SDGs, and that after she did a lot of political work, she did she worked on co-ops with Black women in the South, um, raising. Uh, animals and selling them and providing economic benefit for their communities while at the same time being sustainable about what they ate and making sure that things were local before it was popular. So I just wanted to use those two two examples of folks who I think really kind of talked about confluence in ways that the SDGs uh, lifts up and personifies. I'm going to chime in and actually I see somebody else talking in the chat about at least one person that I would put who is Wangari Matai, who um, was a pit educated uh, activist that uh, went on to do amazing sustainability work across the continent of Africa. Her legacy is more than 50 million trees planted at this point in the continent, just showing that people who care and have passion and engage with these things can make a big difference. And then I, I like you bringing up Jonas Salk, um, who not only invented the polio vaccine, but did actually go on to do a lot of important thinking and writing um, about these issues and about what it means to be human and human society. And one of his quotes, I always uh, think about in doing this work, or one of the things I think about in doing this work is he, he posed the question, are we being good ancestors? Mm -hmm. Which I think is really. So I'm gonna have two, uh, one is so obvious, I can't believe no one said it, but Barack Obama, um, we got the climate accord, we got the SDGs under him, but also since he's left the focus on youth. I mean, that was really an important um, thing for him. And uh, just the other night when we were feeling a little bit down, we, we went, pulled up a bunch of Obama YouTube things, but also came across the 2016 UN General Assembly speech that he made. Um, and it really speaks to precisely the issues. But I, here's an unusual suspect. Chris Martin of Coldplay uh, has been a big champion um, right after the SDGs were adopted. Um, but before I had been confirmed for the Senate, there's a huge big global citizens concert in um, Central Park to celebrate the SDGs. And he was a, a key part of it. And you know, if you got to make the SDGs on some some level accessible, cool, and uh, speaking to youth. And so, the more that we have Chris Martin and others doing that, uh, we, we we got a chance. Excellent. Thank you all so much for a really, really just terrific program. I think you've given everyone so much to not just think about, but to act on, right? That's the hope with these conversations is how do we move dialogue into action? And I think you've given us a lot uh, to work with. So thank you, Ambassador Mendelssohn, Dr. Portlock, Chief Lane, and obviously our superstar moderator, Hannah Shin. Thank you so much. A video of this conversation is going to be available on the World Affairs Council Facebook page and our YouTube. Uh, we have our next program is already scheduled in terms of in the Building Back Better series, uh, actually inspired by uh, Jonas Salk. We are going to be speaking with Dr. Dupree of the University of Pittsburgh Center for Vaccine Research. Uh, that conversation is taking place on June 26 at 9 a.m. We hope to see you all there. Thank you so much, everyone, and take good care.